Awesome. Well, without further ado, I just want to get started, man. Like you just help me take it away with, um, you know, the best practices, how you start, you know, what, uh, what makes the most sense. Um, I know just to kind of, for, for the people that don't know, um, you know, Brian has, has gotten well over a thousand uh, uh, placed turning 65 referrals, um, both MedSup and Medicare Advantage, probably a lot of MedSup in there too. Um, and he knows, you know, the game. He knows, you know, how many to expect, how to get them uh, actually wanting to refer to you, um, how to find the people, all these different variables that people are looking for. And of course, it still takes some elbow grease. Um, but when you know that the, the proof is there, I, I actually tell you the story, man, it's funny. Jackson Taylor in our meeting this morning told a great story. I'm going to butcher this guy's name. Roger Satterfield or Robert Satterfield. Anyway, guy, he's the guy, if you look him up by not his name, he's the guy that was the first person to run a four minute mile. And it was in 1954. So regardless of how old you think the earth is, it's five or 6,000 years up to billions of years old, depending on who you are. I don't want, I'm not getting into that debate, but let's say the youngest interpretation, uh, let's say it's 6,000, 10,000 years old, whatever, the youngest interpretation. It took multiple thousands of years for people, for someone to break the four minute mile, 1954, it was done. How long do you think it took, Brian, for the next person to break the four minute mile after that. I'm going to guess 18 months, three months. You know, no why? you know why mentally mm -hmm. once someone knows it can be done, they're <laughs> willing to try. And so I think that's the, the case in point here, or the, or, or, or the, the, the reason I bring that up is Brian is a is a he, not he has good information, but he's also a case study in that it can be done, and it should give you the confidence, and you know maybe even through working with him and other capacities, the consult to go out and replicate this because, as far as a profitability on business, lifetime value per client, um, you know, uh, uh, building a you know, a wildfire like referral base. Um, because guess what, guys, the, the clients that are referred to you by a financial advisor also refer better than the average clients. So it becomes like a, like a wildfire. You know? So without further ado, I'm going to get uh, Brian to start talking because you guys hear me talk all the time and he's got the actual gold information. So Brian, take it away, brother. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And that's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, great reference. I mean, the fact is um building a business by aligning your medicare practice with the financial advisor community is is so worth it you know and the conversations you and i have had justin i i know the thing that i've noticed you get lit up about when we when we chat about business development um and everybody who knows you knows you know you, you've got a great team you spend i don't know a hundred thousand dollars a month just on marketing and anytime you and I talk, you go, wow, it's like zero cost per zero dollar cost per acquisition with the financial advisors. Now, like you said, you can quantify the uh, the, the the efforts it takes in business development, maybe in maybe not so much in dollars, but effort. But it's so worth it. Um, and the fact is, honestly, anybody can do it. it. I think it's so important to kind of understand your audience and. Um, Working with financial advisors seems to be like the golden goose. You talk to any Medicare agent, even if they're successful in some other way or lots of other ways, like, oh, you work with financial advisors, that's great. And one of the things I notice is people will, you know, ask me a few questions and then they'll say, you know, I've got a, a neighbor who's a financial advisor and there's another one in my B&I group. And I kind of listen politely and I'm like, well, that's awesome you need like 50 more, right? hundred more, whatever it is. I mean, everything we do in this business is a volume game. And, um, but the leverage that comes with funny working with financial advisors is really unmatched. Um, the, the biggest, the biggest thing I would want to impress upon Medicare agents is it's not about showing up and saying, Hey, you're a financial advisor. 
awkward silence for three seconds. I do Medicare, right? That's, I mean, it's going to go absolutely nowhere fast. The, the thing that people need to know about financial advisors is that they're very process driven. It's, it's, it's not that it's not important that you're a nice person. It's not that it's not important that you're trustworthy. It's not that it's not important that you're competent. Um, but financial advisors have to know a lot about a lot without being able to claim expertise in most of it. Okay. Portfolio management, they probably need to, you know, demonstrate expertise, but if you if you really dig into the overall financial planning process, uh, they are pulling in um, subject matter experts in so many different parts of the financial plan, and um, and the goal is hey you know here's here's what I know I can't be the expert but here is my expert and that person's job to reduce um any feelings of uncertainty of how this is going to go really needs to have a process. So having a process that fits into the financial advisor's broader financial planning process is really what connects the two practices. And um, coconut water. Yeah. My son, it's Be careful, 15. man. You got to make it through the end of this. And, and that's right. And coconut water, man. It, that, that got the best of me the other day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know, I'm in my rookie season with the coconut water. My son's 15. He's becoming a health nut. And he's just reading labels. And, you know, he drinks a lot of Gatorade, but he burns a lot of calories. Not, not as many as me. And I said, what should I have? I said, Co coconut water. So actually, I probably needed that reminder from you. So, yeah. Um, I took I, a quick sidebar. I took, I, I was at uh, me and my daughter. We, there's a grocery store here called Brooks, and it's it's a really it's kind of a boutique grocery store. There's like four or five of them in the area, but they they do a great job. Like they'll, you can go in there and just buy like already grilled steaks, their smoked steaks and stuff. Anyway, I was in there and I was like buying kind of things that I don't normally buy. Normally, our groceries are delivered, but we were just having fun. She wanted to go. And I got this big can of coconut water, and uh, I'm in this. I'm in a a fitness stage and so i get home and i put on my wife's weighted vest 30 pound weighted vest i drink half a can of coconut water and i was like i'm gonna go for a five mile walk get about three and a half miles into it and i'm like oh crap literally <laughs> <laughs> too much information but i had to call my daughter and i was like you have to come get me on the golf cart God, get me to the golf cart yeah, no way i'm gonna make it all the way home so coconut <laughs> water which is good i mean maybe i should drink it more <laughs> but right but I saw that and I was like, oh, Brian, no bathroom. Break. Yeah, <laughs> noted, noted. Yeah, I, I honestly, I probably needed that uh, that reminder. So um, we just oh, bought, I just bought sorry, a bunch of it last sorry night. For derailing. I just, I, every time I see coconut water, I think of that day. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. But the, uh, um, but ulti ultimately, I think what might be helpful is to kind of go back to kind of when I first, um, uh, first started the business. Um you know, the, the, the beauty of this business is we get a lot of practice. Okay. So, so no matter what process or mentorship anybody can get in this business, it's important to go out and do it multiple, multiple times. Um, and, and that's really kind of where you get confidence in, in, in anything. And the beauty of Medicare is, you know, you close a deal, you just got a $20 a month pay raise. You missed out on a deal you missed out on a $20 a month pay raise. It's pretty inexpensive education as long as you're willing to go out and kind of do it. And what I found is when I first started off is like I said, it's just about building a process and letting the, and, and, and speaking to the advisor in the terminology that they know. So ultimately, if I go back to when I started the business, when I engaged advisors, I just said, Hey, um, you know, here's what I think I know about your practice. Your clients rely on you for everything with a dollar sign. Um, here's the other thing I think I know is that the only topic in the fi your financial planning software that you overlook and skip over is probably Medicare. Now, it's the one part of the financial planning process where with no animosity, but your clients are looking away from you for advice. How nice might it be to get them looking back towards you at the moment they're looking away? And that speaks to financial advisors. 
A um, couple things that are important to impress upon a financial advisor, because financial advisors don't want to look silly or unprepared, right? Is that it's really important early on, Justin, to let advisors know that Medicare is good news to great news for virtually every single client. P advisors don't expect that, right? They still goof around Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, they don't know the difference, which is okay. Uh, but number one, Medicare is good news, and you like being associated with the good news, right? Mr. or Mrs. Financial Advisor, those are things that are going to start sinking hooks into, into the advisor. Now, it's important to let them know, hey, everybody's eligible at age 65. You probably didn't need me to tell you that. But most of your clients are not enrolling at age 65. I'm going to say that we're we're coming up on about, maybe we're about 1,400 clients now. Um, we meet. We meet everybody at 64 for the most part. We're probably doing 40% of the enrollments at age 65 and 60% 60 after 65, okay? But whether a client's going on Medicare at 65 or they're going to work until it stops being fun, what financial advisors need to know is that starting at age 64, their clients, current and future clients, start getting more mail than you can possibly imagine. And I make it fun for the advisor. I tell them, look, whatever you think a lot of mail is in your head right now, over the course of a year, triple it. It's insane. Okay. And I really drive that home. And I say, and it's all, not all, but it's mostly fear-based marketing, deadlines, penalties, consequences. That's probably not the way you run your business, right, Mr. and Mrs. Financial Advisor? Again, sinking another hook, right? Because that speaks to them. Um, So... <clears throat> So I tell them, look, your action step, if you choose to accept it, is to sort for just your 64-year-olds. Most financial advisors, and this is something you and I have chatted about a lot, Justin, um, in the context of what a Medicare agent should expect from a great financial advisor relationship, most financial advisors have three to six clients who are 64 at any given time. It's not a gigantic list, okay? So therefore, from one one thing I know it's rattling around in your head right now, Justin, because we've talked about it is, hey, th this is not about having one or two financial advisor relationships. It's probably right. having 50, 100, 150, right? When I think, um, I think about that too, because like we don't, as Medicare agents, we think, okay, I, you know, when, when you think about how many clients is a lot of clients for a Medicare agent, you think about, you know, a thousand, you know, 1500, 500, 2000, whatever your number is, right? You know, I think, I think a hundred thousand, <laughs> but, but like, you know, whatever, whatever that number is, you're thinking about it in volume. Um, but a typical financial advisory firm can be doing a lot of revenue on, you know, 150, 200 clients, you know, and that's, that could be a big firm, especially if the average assets per client are high. So, right. That's why that number is lower, right? Because you're not, you know, that, uh, and and so, yeah, I, I think I just like the the reasoning behind that so people can get behind like, well, wait, am I talking to a small advisor? No, these are all moderately successful to higher successful advisors. I mean, you would, I'd want the referrals from the young advisor too. I want them from everybody, but the, the median group, I would say, is going to have a couple hundred clients or, you know, a few hundred clients, and then they're going to have you know, four to six, whatever T sixty fives at at any given time. No, great point. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I feel like most of my relationships at Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley, UBS, Wells Fargo, um, most of those advisors have about a million dollar um, minimum, and um, most of those advisors probably have have about a hundred clients. Um, but th there are other firms where if you're working with maybe a, you know, lower net worth or you're, it's just part of a bigger group, it could easily be several hundred, um, you know, maybe a hundred, 200 per, per, per lead advisor. Mm -hmm. Um, tomorrow I'm doing a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm joining a, an RIA team, uh, for their monthly meeting in, um, Northern California by zoom. But uh, they do about twelve million dollars in revenue, and uh, you know when I met them a few about two months ago, we ran a list of their sixty four year olds, and I think they had like you know sixty of them between everybody in in, in the company. But um, but I'm getting introduced through the CEO of the company, right? So um, it's it's just a 
a great way. So there is a possibility we can capture all 60. But but the typ typical advisor is three to six. Um, the beauty of it only being three to six is that it's easy to get financial advisors to take action. I found, you know, if it was 20 or 30, 64 year olds per lead advisor, and you're coming in saying, Hey, drop everything you're doing and make 20 or 30 phone calls. Uh, it's probably not going to happen, but three to six phone calls a year, which will take all of about 40 minutes. You can get a financial advisor, not only to do, but to get excited to do right. So ultimately, very important to, to let them know you have a process, tell them Medicare is good news, let them know the chaos that their 64-year-olds uh, are in because of that fear-based marketing, and then just show them and empower them on how to demonstrate a little bit of unexpected leadership. So ultimately, I, I think it's also important to um, let everyone know I don't spend a a second talking to med to financial advisors about parts A, B, C, or D. I don't go through any of that. Um, if they want to join me on a call with their client, they'll get a front row seat to that part of the presentation. But all I do is speak to financial advisors about how to demonstrate unexpected leadership within their financial planning process. This, this is a big issue with um, with with. Medicare agents that we see that are successful, as in they have maybe a, a small town practice or, you know, a referral basis locally uh, or whatever, when they're trying to scale, is that they are, and I, I see it a lot with female agents that are, they're so passionate. And by all means, I think they probably do a better job than I have ever done with Medicare beneficiary. They, they are the best. But they have to understand that when they're talking to business owners that are trying to grow, their problem is not understanding Medicare. They don't want to understand Medicare. Um, and, and most people do not care about the Inflation Reduction Act's impact on Part D or, you know, uh, network adequacy or all this BS that, you know, you think would impress someone. It doesn't. It's good for you to know as a Medicare agent, but you're the only one that needs to know that. You know, you're not training them. You're not trying to recruit them. You know, and you're you're trying to get them to to just know that you're the expert. And honestly, there's a reason that the presidents in the United States speak to everyone at a fifth grade level because no one wants to be talked to about like you know intense technical jargon. They just want to know that they can trust you. They like you. Your their customers will like you, and their customers won't think you're an obsessive compulsive know it all. Um, and honestly, when someone comes at me immediately telling me too much technical jargon about some topic. I think like, and I can talk to anyone, but I think would I introduce this person to my, my uh, customers, you know, and that might, whether that's my agents or my, my actual Medicare consumers, uh, I don't want to put anyone in front of them. That's going to confuse them or bewilder them. I just want someone that's going to simplify them, help them be likable and trustworthy. And I think that they're all looking for the same thing. If they, they don't even know they're looking for it, but once they know that it's a problem, uh, that that's what they want. Well, I think that that's a that's great insight. One, one of the things I try to impress upon the financial advisors that we work with is look, at the end of the day, we're all prob salespeople. Now, you know, the more highbrow a financial advisor gets, the less that they like identifying as a salesperson, but in, in some capacity, that's part of all of our jobs. Um that being said, I tell advisors, look, even though at the end of the day, some part of our job is being salespeople, most of us try not to have to behave that way any more often than we have to, not villainizing being a salesperson. But in order to not feel like a salesperson or not be perceived as a salesperson, there needs to be some limited resource elsewhere in a process, right? Um, one of the beauties of Medicare is that it's unnecessarily complicated. So anytime you can turn a complicated topic into something simpler, you're in a position to earn credibility, right? Number two is that there's a deadline. The deadline's not my fault or your fault, Justin, but anytime you can help somebody meet a deadline, again, you're not necessarily being perceived as a salesperson. So the beauty of what we do um, and this is what I share with with advisors. I get to your point without ever talking to them about parts A, B, C, or D, or the donut hole, or anything like that. 
is look, you know, you, you have an opportunity to, you, your clients are not stabbing a voodoo doll of you saying this son of a gun's not talking to me about Medicare at age 64. Um, they do not expect your help, but they really appreciate it. So, so much of the success that we've had at Design My Medicare is helping financial advisors learn and feel empowered to demonstrate unexpected leadership with their clients at the height of the client's confusion. The client does not expect their help, but they really appreciate it. It's it's a it's a it's about turning a complex topic into something simple and helping them meet the deadline. So it's very highly qualitative, and the results of that process uh, reflect really well on the advisor. Um, people ask me often, you know, well, do you pay every advisor a hundred dollars? I in 1400, uh, closed clients, I've maybe written a hundred dollar check, maybe 15 or 16 times, you know, it's, it's just, it's not what's important. What's important is being the advisor, being the person that the client thinks of every time there's an issue with a dollar sign and um, being able to act in, in, in a way that feels like an extension of the financial advisor's financial planning process is, is just gold to the advisor. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Like it, I don't, I, you know, the referral based relationships and I, like I've told you before, we never attack the financial advisor firms. Um, but a lot of people worry about paying people for referrals. And I just found that it's not all that it's not, it's not necessary. You know, I mean, uh, there's probably a few times where I could have gotten someone who did refer us to get more enthusiastic about referring by sending them. I would even say this, like, you know, like I, I would be more inclined to send a client who referred someone to me, a gift card, Right. to encourage that behavior or just let them know I, I appreciate it than the financial advisor. The financial advisor, I think it becomes a business decision for them that they're helping you. You're going to help them. Um, they're helping their client. It's it's just a win on that front. And, and it keeps them away from sending that, that client talking to a Medicare person who is another financial professional or at least trying to be. You know, you're not right. the man that feeds. Um, and, and, and you could even say that, like, I feel like one of those, one of that potential opening lines, and you have this down to a science, but one of those potential opening parts of the conversation to me would be like, look, we're all aware that you're, you, you, Mr. Merrill Lynch, whatever, um, you know, you want to edify them. I would say like, you, you're a, an eminently qualified financial services professional. You're going through insane amounts of, you know, info relative to that. I am not that guy, you know, uh, I, I, that is not my lane. My lane is Medicare. Medicare is hard enough for this guy. That's all I, I want to focus on Medicare. And because you're eminently qualified for that, that, that financial, um, the financial conversation, what I want to help you do is keep your client from accidentally ending up with a Medicare guy who is pretending that they are as qualified as you to help someone with, with financial decisions. So all I want to do is offload the Medicare and then send them back to you every time they have a, you know, complex life insurance question, long-term care, annuity, you know, anything in that financial realm, I want to re-edify you, send it back to you because over here, we don't bite the hand that feeds. We are the Medicare guys. So, I mean, you yeah. know, in some version of that, that's, as you get into that conversation, I feel like that's the sentiment you want to drive home. No, and that, that's great insight. Um, you, you know, I, I walk through the uh, our process with a financial advisor and I tell them, look, at the end of the day, our revenue and our compliance is focused around the end user, your client. Our real client is you, the financial advisor. Everything that, and I tell my team this, everything that we do the litmus test is we have to ask ourselves, is is everything we're doing reflecting well on the financial advisor? If the answer is yes, everybody's going to win. Um, now, once I uh, explain to the advisors how to engage their clients at age 64, 65, I tell them, look, these are your clients. You're welcome to be on 100% of the calls or Zooms that we have with your client. Most advisors choose to be on exactly 0%, okay? 
Um, and I tell them, look, I empathize with that. Uh, but I'd really encourage you to join me on one or two just from a due diligence standpoint. Um, and also selfishly, I love for the advisor to have a front row seat to what their client is experiencing. So we go through what Medicare is, what it isn't, what they have to do by when. Most of these clients have IRMA exposure. Um, so we dig into that exposure and kind of paint a path for what to expect. Can we appeal our way out of it prematurely? That sort of thing. Um, and then months or years after that first meeting, Justin, then we're going to show them how to enroll in A and B. We'll, uh, we, we have a very agnostic approach to help them weigh the differences between Medicare supplement, Medicare Advantage, and then we're going to get an actual result. Could be three years after we met the client at age 64. But now we have an actual result under the watchful eye of the advisor. They didn't have to do anything other than engage their clients at 64 and say, hey, how much mail are you getting? Throw it out. We have a guy or we have a team uh, at Design My Medicare to, to help us with that. Um, but to your point, and coming back to your recent point and then your earlier point, now we have an actual result, okay? Um, the advisor didn't have to do anything other than really call the client at age 65. Um, I think some of the success that we are having as a result of ha bringing, you know, I'm not saying we're out here curing cancer, but it's a little bit of an unexpected level of sophistication as it relates to guiding them through the Medicare process. Um, one of the things I really impress upon advisors is that once we conclude the enrollment and nothing I share with an advisor is based in theory. It's all comes from real experience, guiding real high net worth clients of real financial advisors into Medicare for real, right? And this is where I tell them, look, our businesses have some similarities. One of the places it's disparate is in the volume of clients we help because like we uh, touched on earlier, the typical advisor has, you know, a hundred or $150 million under management, but just from like a hundred clients. And I tell them, it's, you know, look, you have a much deeper relationship. I mean, I, we will, between my, uh, my LOA agents and me will probably do, I don't know, over, I mean, I don't know, last year I did 250 enrollments just, to, just on my own. Right. Um, the beauty of that is we get this larger sample set to just observe what's important to people and advisors like, like hearing about this part as well. And what I can share with you is that once we conclude your, uh, your client's enrollment, what I have observed 1400 times now is I get this borderline magical moment. Only if you ask me to Mr. or Mrs. Financial advisor, but to, chat with your client about what the next most worthwhile conversation with you should be. And what I've observed 1400 times is that there's three topics that are the easiest for me to gently introduce. If you ask me to number one is long-term care planning. If it's yet to be addressed by the time Medicare enrollment concludes, it's a very easy topic for us to bring up. We're not looking to get over our skis. We're looking to capitalize on um, a, a highly qualitative experience and offer some insight to guide the client back to the advisor, either being open to the next part of their financial planning process. And if we really nail it, the client's excited about it. So number one is long-term care planning. Number two would be lifetime income planning, which could be inclusive of an annuity discussion or exclusive to it. There's a lot of ways to create income, but it's a nice path to go from Medicare to lifetime income planning. And third is 401k rollovers. Um, Advisors don't expect it, but we meet everybody at age 64 because of the mail, right? And that's that's the key time to engage clients and swoop in and let them know you know what's going on and tell them they can throw out the mail because the advisor has a process. So if we meet the client at age 64, you know, three years and two months later when that client's ready to retire, sometimes we get knowledge of the exact retirement date. Um, before the advisor does. And I tell the advisors, look, I'm not saying you're asleep at the wheel and have no idea your 68 year old clients contemplating retirement, but you know, you can talk to them about that 401k rollover until you're blue in the face. You're not going to execute anything until they leave the company. Well, they don't leave the company until Medicare is set up. So chronologically, sometimes we capture knowledge of the exact retirement date before 
the advisor does. And it's a great validation of our process and our role in the partnership to be able to come back to the advisor like a dog with a bone and say, hey, your client just called up and they're retiring, you know, July 31st, that rollover is in play August 1st. Um, is there any part of your financial planning process you want us to gently introduce? Most of the time, the advisors say no, but sometimes they say, hey, Brian, you know, uh, we brought up long-term care a year ago. They didn't say no. We didn't push it. If you saw an opportunity to reignite that conversation, that would be great. Um, and and it, anytime we can do that, it's a it's a great validation of the symbiosis that their process and our process have. Yeah, I could I could definitely see that being the case, man. Um, obviously, you have this thing rocked rocked out and you have a process that works. You're finding the right people. You're getting in front of them. You're having the conversation in the right way and you're helping other people replicate that right now. So which I think is 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 awesome because, you know, everybody's looking for more and more compliant ways to get in there. I mean, Mississippi just passed this law saying and we're still trying to clarify <laughs> what this means, but it said you can't outbound dial for Medicare supplements or Medicare Advantage. Um, we don't cold call, but there's actually some language in there that makes it look like even if they requested information digitally, like you couldn't call a lead. Um, you know that the only that the, potentially the only initiation is that they called you first, or that they somehow like you know really really expressed call me, um, and so it's like. And I think more and more of that type of stuff comes and then the compliance gets harder and harder, but a referral based practice, you just don't have to worry about that. So the people that are like really trying to get in and work with you on, uh, on, on an ongoing basis, learning how to do it. I know we had kicked off a class a while back. Um, what was the process and that, how do people really, um, get plugged in with what you're doing, Brian, and try to try to, not try to, but will replicate it if they just take the steps that you're telling them to take. Yeah. So the, um, so one of, one of the ways, which is probably, which, which is available to everybody is to, um, uh, you know, anybody's welcome to en en engage us or enroll in the five week, uh, accelerator class. So, um, Obviously, agents at our agency have access to this information, but, you know, one of the beautiful, beautiful things about, you know, the way you've built your business, Justin, is just making, making information and education available to people in a variety of different ways. Um, I mean, every, every single person can't be part of your, your, your downline agency, but that doesn't mean every single person does, can't benefit from the education. So, um, so probably the easiest way is to uh, join the, the five-week accelerator program where you learn to align your Medicare business with your local financial advisor community. Um, we have five uh, classes over that time. And um, it, the, the one that just wrapped up is a great group of advisors. We had uh, several people make some, some measurable uh, gains in, in working with financial advisors in their community. And ultimately, we just kind of lay out, a, a, a number one, it's a great community of people to go through this process uh, with because it's, it's usually not the rookie Medicare agent who joins this class. It's usually somebody who's demonstrated some amount of success already. And um, one, that's just a neat group of people to be part of. But number two, what the class will do over those five weeks is basically just help you identify a, a game plan, who the financial advisors are in your backyard. I do business across the country, but that's kind of where it has manifested into. The very best thing is build it right in your backyard. You're tripping over financial advisors in the same way that you're tripping over doctor's offices in your local community. So learn how to identify them, um, learn how to break down the vernacular that uh, advisors respond to, and then basically bring it to another level. How do you speak to a, a Morgan Stanley financial advisor versus a Merrill Lynch financial advisor? What's the name of the financial planning software that they use at, you know, UBS financial services so that you, when you walk in the door, it's you're, you're, you're quickly demonstrating that you understand their culture, you understand their software and you understand their business. Right. So, um, that information is is actually, I, I think, what the last group of students appreciated the most and really empowered them to just go out and start engaging financial advisors. You know, what's the 
culture at Edward Jones versus the culture at, you know, Wells Fargo advisors. So we, we break that down. We lay out a game plan. We work on building kind of an email list, um, um, give guidance on, you know, how to not blow up your email list by over emailing or doing things in mass and, you know, using the right software to do that, um, sharing uh, success stories. So really anybody who joins that, that, that class, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a, a bold prediction that, uh, by, by the end of the year, anybody who, um, actually applies the elbow grease could easily have their first 50, uh, client referrals from, uh, a group of financial advisors in their community, uh, by year end, if it's something that they're willing to, um, uh, to, to, to follow the process, follow the instruction and, you know, hold others accountable to doing the same thing while they're being held accountable to do the same thing. I mean, the last class was just awesome. And I just can't wait for the next one. Awesome, brother. Well, we are excited. Um, the quickest way to people to reach out to you, of course, you know, by email, I think was what we had said last time, Brian at designmymedicare.com. Brian with an I, uh, at designmymedicare.com. Um, any other ways you would re-encourage people to reach out uh, quickly? You know, a lot of people reach out to me on on uh, Facebook Messenger just because I'm becoming a bit more active in in in, in your group. Um, so that's okay. We reply to that as well. We we um um so I'm pretty responsive to that as well. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for the time today, Brian. Uh, what you've built is incredible. We're hoping more and more of our agents and agency owners uh, can tap into that. Um, obviously, it helps me when I have an agency owner that taps into your courses. I think I have a few that did this last time that are already getting like four or five, six T65 referrals a month off of it um, and expecting to scale it past that. And that that's always great for an FMO <laughs> because oh, we, yeah. we and our agents to be able to write business. We're always looking for lead sources and ways to think outside the box. And uh, and this is just one of those. Is you, everybody talks about it, but most people never tell you how to do it and, and you know how to do it. So why not learn from the best? Um, so people email them, Brian at designmymedicare.com, add him or follow him on Facebook. And uh, let's get in that next class because it's going to be impactful for many people. So. Thanks, Brian. We'll talk to you soon, brother. Sounds good, man. Thank you.